Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. I'm Mark. Hello. How are you doing? The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! <laughs> Good morning, Mark. Morning, Basil. Morning. And what a show we have. Well, we've got a top guest today. Wow. I'm quite uh, quite keen to get this chap uh, on the air. He's uh, he's an interesting chap, certainly. Well, how and his subject matter. How exciting. What if Hitler had lived? What if he didn't die in the bunker in 1945 and lived and died of old age? In Argentina. In Argentina, of all places. And there seems to be a lot of evidence to support this. There does seem to be a fair bit, certainly. It's... Uh, not quite as uh, as closed as people might think. It seems there's an awful lot of contradictory, or well, contradictory to the mainstream story, at least. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, so many of the uh, minor Nazi officers escaped yeah. to Argentina. Are you telling me that the... That's true. Yeah, they, they couldn't get the uh, the head honcho out. The uh, story of his escape... It'd be unusual, is, uh, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. The story of his, his escape is, is quite interesting. It would certainly make a nice uh, film. Yeah. I'm not sure if there is a film being made of it. I think I read somewhere that there may be a film. There might be. Yeah, we shall have to ask the man uh, himself when the, he comes on. The author we're speaking to today, uh, Gerard Williams, he's a filmmaker as well. He's worked on the uh, yeah. Discovery Channel. I think so, yeah. I think I read that in his uh, in his bio as well. Um, we should probably also credit Simon Dunstan, who's not with us today, but he's the, he's the co-author. He's a military historian. Yeah, well, well, Gerard has been a journalist now for 30 years, is it? I think it was something like that. He's very yeah. well established and uh, I, I believe well respected. I think he's worked for Sky and he's, uh, he's of BBC as well. He's responsible for thousands and thousands of hours of broadcast material. Yeah, yeah. He, what was he, a foreign correspondent, I think yeah, he was, he, if I remember he's correctly. Wo- he's worked for uh, Reuters, was it? I think there was BBC, I think, and Sky. We yeah. shall have to ask him. He's worked for a lot of big names, anyway. Oh, wow. He certainly seems to know his beans. He's a proper journalist. He seems he, to know what he's talking about. Well, they've been researching this for five years. That's a long time, isn't it? That's a long time. Mm. The, the book, we should probably give it a pre-plug before he comes on, uh, is called Grey Wolf, uh, The Escape of Adolf Hitler. And, um, yeah, it, it looks like a very interesting book. We've read the synopsis of it and some of the background information, and uh, certainly seems very interesting. Yeah, it's published in October 2011, so it's available on Amazon. Yes, we've got a link to it on our website, actually, as well, as on, we on, on the shop and, button, um, which actually takes you to Amazon. I've seen Gerard on the uh, Frost Report with David Frost. Did you? And I've, I've not uh, seen that. Uh, uh, yes, I, I watched him on, the, on Sky News. Yeah, I saw the Sky News interview we did, yeah. so we got a few questions uh, for him about r- that. Rather too short, I thought, for such, yeah. a, for such such a great subject. A little bit awkward as well. Yeah, something odd. Yeah, it was very awkward. Mm. He, they didn't seem overly comfortable about uh, having him on at all, did Most they? Most unusual. We shall have to question him about this. We should. Um, any? Well, do we want to do any news, or do we want to get the, the guest on? I'm really keen to talk to Jared because it's such an interesting subject. He's an interesting chap, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, Grey Wolf, the escape of Adolf Hitler. Let's shall we call him, and then if we if we have time at the end, we'll do some news at the end. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's let's, let's, let's call him now. Let's then, get shall on we? with it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Calling Gerard live. Hopefully, he should be coming through. We're uh, dialing him in uh, London, I believe. Yeah, he's based in London at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, I believe so. He's still working in the media. Yes. Hello, is that Gerard? Yeah. Hang on. Oh, thanks ever so much. <laughs> We ra- we, Hello, Gerard. We rang too early. Hi, Gerard. <laughs> Sorry, we we rang too early. Well, we we were so excited. Yeah, why, not? why do we do that? We're so excited to speak to you. We we, we uh, got ahead of ourselves. We got a bit giddy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so we were just saying that you um, wrote the uh, book, and uh, it's taking you quite a while to to write it. And uh, we only gave a very very brief overview about what it's about. So I thought we thought we'd leave it to you because you're the you're the expert. Do you want to just give a rough overview of what it's about? Well, uh, surprisingly, and then something that shocked both Simon Dunstan, my co-writer, and myself is that. We think that, um, well, we're sure that Adolf Hitler escaped from Germany at the end of World War II and lived in Argentina for 17 years until his death in 1962. Um, Not only Adolf Hitler escaped, but Martin Bormann and Gustavo Müller, the head of the SD, um, Mm -hmm. all from the bunker and all from Berlin. And who who was the other chap there, Martin Bormann? I've heard his name before. I'm not sure who who he is. Who is he? What Martin did he Bormann do? Martin Bormann was the party secretary. He was uh, effectively Hitler's number two, um, the Reichleiter, he was known as. 
Um, he was the man who organized, well, the economics of the Nazi party um, and was probably the most powerful man in the Nazi hierarchy. Right. Um, and the man who controlled access to Hitler in the final days of the war. Well, I mean, we, we never thought that um, we were going to do anything but a rather silly conspiracy theory documentary. I mean, that's how it all started. Um, after I'd been doing a series of documentaries in Argentina on other subjects, quite serious subjects. Um, and we came across this one, and after 30 odd years as a journalist, I thought, you know, I've never really, I've never done a conspiracy theory film. <laughs> and um, this sounded like a, a great idea, you know, the idea that Adolf Hitler had escaped by submarine, of all things, to Argentina at the end of the war. We came across many, many people in Argentina who said this was true. And our research and the research by other people like Gerald Steinacher and uh, various other people in Germany now show that over 30,000 of these people escaped from Germany at the end of the war, never mind the amount of Croats and other European fascists that made it uh, to Argentina. And as we started to look at the whole story and started to look at the, um, the, the deaths in the bunker and everything else, it became pretty obvious that what we'd been told for 65 years was simply not true. There was no forensic evidence to the death of Adolf Hitler in the bunker in Berlin. Um, the skull that the Russians have always said was Adolf Hitler's turned out when it was forensically examined by a DNA expert to be that of a young woman. Um, so not even the Russian skull was Hitler's. And as we started to investigate and started to look further and further into the story, it just became, well, compellingly clear that we had been told um, for whatever reason, the heat of life. It, it seems highly unlikely that he didn't survive. It, it was of his character. It, it was unlike him to uh, commit suicide. He wasn't that type of person, was he? Well, I mean, one of the problems with doing something like this, writing a book like this and being a journalist, is I can't really put myself inside the head of Adolf Hitler. I know historians yeah. put themselves inside the head of people all the time. All that we can do, and what we've done in Grey Wolf, the escape of Adolf Hitler, is present the facts that we have found. Um, Martin Bormann, definitely, he wrote that he fully intended to survive, and we're now sure that Martin Bormann did survive and live a lot longer than Adolf Hitler. Um, but I can't see any reason why, if there had been um, a way out, why Hitler would not have taken it. Um, and I think he waited until the very last moment. I'm not sure why he waited, what he was expecting to happen. Um, but he waited until the very last moment, the um, evening of April the 29th, 1945, before making his escape. Well, um, according to a book you may have read by uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal, the uh, Nazi hunter, the Jewish uh, Nazi hunter, he, he confirms, and of course he apprehended uh, uh, quite a number of uh, Nazis in South America. Yeah, I mean, Wiesenthal is, um, is an interesting character and a great yeah. man in many ways, although he did um, embellish much of his material and many of his stories, which is, oh. um, which is a bit sad. And various people have, um, have tried to debunk his work, yeah. um, especially in recent years. But I, I, what is now coming out, what is now being made public for the first time, is the involvement of American intelligence services and the involvement of the Vatican especially yes. in helping move a mass movement of um, Nazis, war criminals and fascists out of Europe into Latin America at the end of the war. The, Rush, the Germans had been planning this, and Nazis had been planning this from the mid-1930s in Argentina. Argentina was the only country outside of Germany that actually had a Nazi party, a National Socialist Party. Oh. Um, and they had used the swastika as their symbol, surrounded by a, a cogged wheel. Um, and there were, well, we have pictures, moving pictures of a rally celebrating the um, Anschluss of Austria and Germany in Buenos Aires in the 1930s. And there are, there are 30,000 people there, all giving the Hitler salute and uh, all dressed up in those um, rather natty uniforms that these uh, horrible people used to wear. You were saying that you, you originally thought that you were going to write a, a conspiracy theory book. Um, were you originally well, no, not I'm, taking I'm it seriously? Or? A, well, I'm, I'm a TV journalist. I mean, that's what I've done for all my adult life. Yeah. Um, and after, well, after Baghdad and after um, Iraq and Rwanda and uh, various other places, mm. I'd sort of pretty much had enough of doing hard television news. Yeah. Like Reuters, the BBC and Sky. 
and felt that I needed to do longer form documentaries, go to places where it wasn't likely that I was going to be shot or missiled or anything unpleasant again. <laughs> yeah, I've been shot um, at. It's not nice. <laughs> no, it isn't nice. It's just simply unpleasant. And when I was cruise missiled in Baghdad by the Americans, I have to say it felt very personal indeed. That would be a low light for me, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> Yeah, 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 lovely fireworks, but uh, not nice. N to nice to look at, not to be. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. So, so but, I, 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 when the opportunity came up to do what seemed like a silly conspiracy theory, I thought, okay, it's light, you know, it it, it would be amusing. We can add to the um, add to the mythology. Yeah. But it was when we started to actually get into the research, and we Simon and I between us have been to Argentina seventeen times. Um, you know, we've been in talks to people in America and in Germany. Um, we've walked the ground on places that we've, we've reported on. And we've gone back to contemporaneous reporting. I mean, a lot of this material has been published before in places like Time magazine, mm -hmm. um, yeah. The Times, The Daily Express. But for some reason, it's been ignored. Most conspiracy theories come out of... Oh, well, we don't know where they come from. Most of them come from people's... Uh, strange and weird imaginations, but your your co-author Simon Dunstan is a proper poker military historian, and you are a a, a real bona fide uh, investigative journalist with decades years. of experience. Yeah. Mm. This this story wasn't just thought up in the back bedroom of a of a teenager or anything strange or or in a mental asylum like most conspiracy theories seem to seem to come from. This is no, it's not, but, you know, as a journalist over the years, I've come up against loads of conspiracy theories mm. and they usually take about 18 seconds to knock down yeah um they're usually completely rubbish i mean gray wolf is not a conspiracy theory what gray wolf is is the presentation of the detailed cover-up of a conspiracy yeah that has lasted for over 65 years but but you have you, you you've uh, you've got so much uh, testimony from witnesses haven't you uh, uh gerard we have and um, you know two of those witnesses have actually been threatened with death in Argentina. They've been told that they'd be mm. killed if they continued to work with us. Wow. And I think that was probably, there had been a number of sort of turning points for me on this story. But the fact that people were being threatened and they were taking those threats very seriously um, was something I thought, hang on, why would you threaten somebody in any way, shape or form if there wasn't more to the story than, than originally meets the eye? And it was it was that, I suppose, that made me stop thinking of this as a conspiracy theory and start looking at it as a story that had not been told. Mm. It's interesting that they're threatening people with, that with death uh, here and now, but this story is somewhat years old. So that then asks the question, who, who are they protecting? Are they protecting people who are still alive? I don't think I don't think anybody's still alive. Um, none of the major. Um, no, well, surely they'd be a bit old by now. But maybe Hitler, Hitler dead in 1962. Mm. But what they are protecting is the economic loot that was stolen mm. by the Nazis mm. and taken out of Germany at the end of World War Two. Yeah. Um, much of that, which was funneled back into Germany in the 1950s to build what became known as the West German economic miracle. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to remember that companies like Hugo Boss, Siemens, Krupp, Tussen, BASF. Um, well, you name it, any major German, German company, during World War II used slave labor, supported the Nazis, um, you know, did horrendous things, horrendous things. Mm. Um, and yet these companies kept their names and are still massively successful today. I mean, Siemens is one of the biggest IT contractors to the yeah. British government, never mind the fact that Hugo Boss is on everybody's street. Well, Hugo Boss designed the uniforms for the SS and had slave workers make them, and yet people still buy their products. I find that, well, I, I find it disgusting personally, but yeah. um, I'm sure many other people wouldn't. But I think that what is being protected is the country buying wealth, which the Nazis moved out from 1943 onwards. Yeah. And we're, not, we're, we're talking in part major shipments of you know, hard stuff, gold, jewelry, artwork, whatever, by ship from Spain to Argentina and to Brazil. Um, but what we're talking about in the 1940s is international transfers through banks in Switzerland that took their 5% commission and then shoveled that money into banks in Argentina and, well, in lots mm -hmm. of other neutral countries as well. Syria, um, Egypt was involved, uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Chile. They shipped and shifted electronically, even in those days, billions and billions and billions of dollars 
Um, Martin Bormann, who was the, the, the criminal genius behind this, was known as the Telex General. And the guy used communications to their utmost extent. And the idea that you couldn't move uh, material wealth electronically in those days um, is simply not true. Bormann set up over 745 front companies in neutral territories so they could move patents, shareholdings, bearer bonds, and everything else out to them. Um, Tristan, the steel manufacturer, set up 700 of its own front companies around the world. So it, even though they were partially destroyed in Germany, the real wealth still existed outside. And that wealth is controlled by the, by the children of these, these Nazi leaders. So that's what they're protecting, if nothing else. It mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Um, getting back to uh, Hitler while he was alive in Argentina, uh, do you know, Jared, in what way he would have been active or what he was doing? It, it, it's a very strange and, and sort of rather banal middle-class story of he and Ava having tea with various um, supporters over there. I think that it, in the early part of the um, of the exile, up until 1948, when Martin Bormann arrived in Argentina, there was probably hope that they could rebuild the Fourth Reich. Yes. Or rebuild a Fourth Reich and have you know a fascist um, resurgence yes. around the world. I think when Martin Bormann, who was a realist in all things, got to Argentina and had a look at the situation, he realized that the Nazi brand was completely shot, that you could never have tens of thousands of people marching behind the swastika again in their black boots, yeah. because the world knew about what had happened in the camps. These people had murdered six million people industrially, never mind you know, the, the millions and millions of people they'd murdered on the Eastern Front, um, and of course all, all the people who died fighting them. So I think Bormann realized at that stage that the party could never come to life again. So he turned it into a banking concern, effectively. Um, up until about 1952, there were still various okay. attempts by people like Hans Ulrich Rudel, who was Hitler's favorite fighter pilot. There were still attempts by people like that to build a right-wing party back in Germany. But they all failed. Um, and they, they failed, I think, because Bormann cut off the um, cut off the money to them. Well, it, it, it and at the same it, time, he yeah. Sorry. Well, it makes sense. The world is controlled by money. If you really want to control, completely. The, yeah. It, and the world is controlled by people without any morals who control the money. Oh, I, <laughs> which is also true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gerard, and, I, think know, I, I think people people would I begin think what to. What happened is that Bormann pr pretty much put Hitler into an exile in exile in Argentina. Yes. Mm. Just like the end of the war, he controlled total access to the Fuhrer, um, and he just made him fade away well, because he was dangerous to his plan. What condition do you think uh, Adolf Hitler would have been in? Would he have been healthy or shell shocked? Uh, you know, he was fifty-six. At, he was fifty-six at the end of the war. Yeah. Um, and you know, there is no evidence for him ever having suffered from Parkinson's disease. No. Um, he did have a scarlet fever pretty badly at the end of World War One. Um, and, of course, in the July bomb plot in 1944, he'd been wounded, and he was probably wounded more badly than, um, than the propaganda machine let go at the time. I see. And interestingly, we've, we've got scientific proof that the last alleged pictures of Hitler in Berlin in 1945, on April 20th, handing out, and they're very famous, he's handing out medals to members of the Hitler Youth. That, that, of, that film footage, that's town. right, yeah. Yeah, and and but it's and, not Hitler. and people say that oh he 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 had aged so much he looked sixty. Well, the man in the film is sixty. It's not Hitler. Yeah, no, the man in the film we we actually had proved by Britain's top facial recognition expert, the guy who identified the seven seven bombers and has worked for you know the Met, well Scotland Yard, you could call it, for many years. We've had it proved that um, those that man is definitely not Adolf Hitler. It doesn't you know it's it's not him. So even up until the 20th of April 1945, there were regular appearances by Hitler's double. And we think there's probably one man, Gustav Weyler, Gustav Weber, um, who is that particular one. But we know from MI5, MI6 reports that there were at least two doubles um, in regular presence at Becker's Garden up at the Eagle's Nest and who regularly appeared to Hitler. And Stalin had six doubles, you know, even well, Monty had it, a double. It's, it's common, it was common practice. Uh, Churchill, I believe, had yeah. doubles and as Monty. well. And Monty? 
and even up to Saddam Hussein, he had doubles. It's uh, it's something that's done. It's yeah, I mean, um, I've, I've actually seen one of Saddam's doubles. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's enough for my first time in Iraq. Um, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the great thing about, well, not the great thing, but the clever thing about this is that they made Hitler die, just like um, Gestapo Muller, the, the head of the police, um, general head of the police, um, Gestapo, in Germany. He was buried in May 1945 in a grave, and his family put up a cute little headstone saying to our dear daddy. Our dear daddy was a murdering swine. Mm. Um, but his grave was actually uh, dug up in 1963 um, because people were uh, incredibly concerned he'd got away. And they found in the grave three bits of other bodies. It was not Gestapo Muller in the, body, in the grave. Um, the Germans found Martin Bormann's body mm. in the 1970s, and then DNA tested it in the 1990s and confirmed it was Bormann dead in Berlin in May 1945. The problem with that is they used an 83-year-old relative of Martin Bormann's for the DNA match, and they refused to name her. Uh -huh. Whereas Bormann had a bunch of kids that they could have done. I mean, it's just a cover-up by um, the West German government and the current German government to what actually happened at the end of World War II. I mean, recently we discovered that the Germans and the CIA both knew where Adolf Eichmann was and his name in Buenos Aires in 1952, eight years before the Israelis snatched him and put him on trial in Tel Aviv. I mean, there's so much there still in the, um, in the files that needs to come out. I think people would probably want to know, just to backtrack a little bit, how did Hitler actually get out? What, what were the, the mechanics of, of his, his exit? Because I, I've heard the, the, the story that you've told before, and uh, it's well worth telling again, because it does sound like something straight out of a James Bond film. Completely, completely. But that, this was reported in Time magazine at the time. The Russians found a secret escape tunnel in Hitler's private quarters in the Chancellery, not in the bunker, but in the Chancery. And that tunnel led down to an underground bunker, um, which had provisions in it for 12 people for three weeks. And a tunnel led from that bunker down to the underground, the U-Bahn, um, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. we, they found um, various things there which made them believe that people had escaped through it, including a note written in a, a woman's hand to her parents, saying that she would not be able to contact them for some time. And the major in charge, the Russian major in charge, Major Nicotine, of all names, <laughs> um, is quoted as saying he believed that note came from Ava Brown. We know that the exit from that tunnel is still there in the underground system. And what we believe happened is that a group of um, Nazis, Hitler, um, Ava Brown, and General Hermann Fagelein, who again is supposedly shot in the bunker at the end of the war, but there's no proof or evidence of that ever happening, made it down through these tunnels into the underground system. They were then escorted through the underground system to um, an underground station of Fair Berliner Platz and up onto a major wide road called the Hockenzollern Dam. On the Hockenzollern Dam, there was waiting for them a JU-52, um, the Nazi transport aircraft, and the autonomous Nazi transport aircraft of World War II, mm -hmm. very much like the Dakota, the DC-3 that the Allies used. Yeah. Um, <coughs> The pilot waiting for them there was Captain Peter Eric Baumgart, who was born in South Africa as a British citizen, who had come back to Germany in the 1930s to join the Nazi Party. As so many international born Germans did, um, came back to you know, rebuild, rebuild the fatherland. <coughs> Captain Baumgart flew them out to um, an airbase at Tonga in Denmark, um, which actually had been the, in, originally the Imperial Zeppelin base in World War I. From there, he, he dropped them off. They were picked up by another aircraft, which flew them to, we believe, Travelmunda on the uh, Baltic coast. And from there, a long-range aircraft, a JU-252, flew them to an airfield just outside, well, 80 miles southwest of Barcelona in Spain. Mm -hmm. That aircraft was destroyed. It was taken apart, dismantled is the word they use. Wow. Um, so there could be no evidence of him arriving. Mm -hmm. And he was then flown on in a Spanish Air Force aircraft to the island of West Ventura, um, where they met three submarines from the U-boat convoy, the last U-boat convoy of World War II, the last Wolfpack of World War II, which was codenamed Seawolf. 
33 days later, after an incredibly uncomfortable trip, because being in a U-boat always was uncomfortable, being in a submarine still is, yep. they arrived at Nacocha on the coast of Argentina. And then that sort of sums up basically how they got out. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? How, when you well, got to there's, Argentina... There's no UFOs here or wonder weapons or Antarctic secret bases. No. This is the, no, it's, it's the hard... final throes of a military machine. It's, and yeah. it was you know, it, it, done it's... in a way that... It was hardly impossible, Gerald, to, to achieve, was it? No, I mean, numerous people flew aircraft over occupied, yeah. allied occupied Europe to mm. Spain. I mean, Leon de Grel, the mm. um, SS general who was the leader of the Belgian fascists, he flew a Heinkel bomber. Well, he didn't fly it, but he was flown in a Heinkel bomber from Norway to San Sebastian on the coast of Spain. Yes. I mean, it's yeah. even longer trip than a shorter range aircraft. Mm. And this happened a lot at the end of World War II. When he arrived in Argentina, was was his was his arrival noted? Was he invited, or was he there in secret? Were they were they collaborating? Well, the the extent of the Nazi penetration in Argentina was huge. Um, I mean, we have documents from um, the German archives, which were found by a man called um, Silvio Santander, who was a, a democratic congressman in Argentina. He found documents post-war which proved that both Ada Perón, Ada Duarte, as she was then, and Juan Domingo Perón were um, being paid by German military intelligence, the Abwehr, from 1941. Mm. Um, Germany funded the coup that brought the generals or colonels to power in Argentina in 1943, and they were intimately and intricately involved in Argentine political and military society. So, although not many people would have known probably that it was Hitler arriving, yeah. they had definitely prepared the ground. I mean, at one stage, just post-war, Peron issued 10,000 Argentine passports, blank passports, um, so that they could be used by Nazis to get to Latin America, to get to Argentina. Wow. Never mind the 30-odd thousand that were issued by the International Committee for the Red Cross, unbelievably, and the thousands that were issued by the Vatican. I mean, yeah. this, was, this wasn't just sort of some, um, oh, quick, let's all get out of here. This was organized. Yeah. This had been being organized for a number of years, and it was incredibly well funded. Oh, you, you, I, I just uh, remembered in the book there, there was um, some testimony from the pilot that flew Hitler. Uh, was there, Jared? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the incredible thing for me, is that this Captain Peter Baumgart was put on trial in Warsaw. Yeah in 1947, because he was suspected of being another Captain Peter Bangard, who'd been on the staff of the SS at Auschwitz, the death camp. Wow. And he got up and he told his story in court under oath, and the Polish judge took one look at him and said, <clears throat> psychiatric testing, please. <laughs> um, yeah. Because by that stage, Hugh Trevor Roper's report was out saying Hitler had died in the bunker. He despite there was no evidence uh, of that. Yes. They sent him away for psychiatric testing, had him tested by three senior Polish psychiatrists, brought him back, declared him sane um, to San trial, and he repeated his story again. Now, this was all covered and reported by Reuters, mm -hmm. the Associated Press, it was reported in the Times and newspapers all around the world, and then forgotten. Peter mm -hmm. Bandot served five years in a Polish jail, it was released in 1951, um, and disappears from history. And, or I haven't been able to find him, maybe a better researcher could, but I haven't been able to find oh, him. Why, why did he serve a sentence, uh, Jared? Being a member of the SS. Oh, I see. Right. All oh, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, prescribed organization, and despite the fact that it was proven that he hadn't been at Auschwitz, being a member of the SS was enough. Um, although it's strange that he actually he did hold SS rank, but he'd also flown with the Luftwaffe for a great deal in World War II. That's right. Um, and described having 138 victories and in, the, in receipt of a Knight's Cross, although he's not on the list of recipients of the Knight's Cross. Um, but there are various people who aren't. Gerard, what do the, um, the the Nazi hunters, if there are, I'm sure I'm sure there are still some left. Yes. I imagine. Uh, what do they make of of your 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 book and your claims and your and your and your story? Are, are they well? Are they perturbed well, by it's, that? It's are they accepting of it? We work very closely with the um, with the sort of umbrella organisation for Jewish groups in Argentina, an outfit called Daya, hmm. delegation Argentinian Israeli. Um, and they were convinced that Martin Bourne had escaped at the end of the war. And we interviewed quite a few people, um, both in Buenos Aires and in Cordoba, about that. They had rumors of Hitler having made it out, but mm. they didn't have anyone near the evidence that they had for Martin Bormann's presence in Argentina post-war. 
Um, there is still the, the Wiesenthal um, organization, but it, it's not really Simon Wiesenthal's operation. He's been dead for some time now. Yeah. Mm. And they were the people who did the last chance thing a couple of years ago where they offered rewards for finding right. um, Alabeth Klein, the, one of the horrible concentration camp doctors. Um, the t terrible thing for me is they actually said, we're coming to look for you, made this public all over the world, yeah. and then didn't find him. Yeah. What a surprise. It's crazy. Um, I mean, here we, we, we have quite good links in, in Israel. Um, Simon works quite a lot with the Israeli defense not works with, but he he writes books about tanks as well. Right. So he's been out and on exercise with the IDF quite a lot, and there's quite a lot of the senior intelligence people. Mm. And they're trying to persuade them to release some of their Mossad files at the moment. Well, um, good luck with that. Is it is it worth is it worth? <laughs> uh, they're one of the few people who have pointed guns at me. Um, is it worth pointing out? Um, what rat lines are, and 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 what and their involvement in in the story, because I, I I didn't know a lot about those. I I knew of the film which made one of them famous, not to give it too much away, but I didn't know they were quite as elaborate as they are until I came to start reading about this recently. I think I mean there's um, there's an extremely good book out there at the moment called Nazis on the Run uh, by a man called Gerald Steinacher or Steinacher. Mm -hmm. um, which details in the most incredible detail the organization that got these people out of Germany, out of the southern Tyrol in Austria, and down to Rome, through the Vatican, and then on to Argentina. Um, and for the first time, he has presented detail after detail after detail after detail. I mean, it, it's, it's sickening mm. how this was done. And, but this was done in a massively organized way. It was financed and it was organized. Why, I mean, I, I was brought up a Catholic, um, although I haven't been one for a very long time and will never be one again, especially after reading what I've read now, despite my lack of faith anyway. <laughs> yeah, we were going to um, come to that. <laughs> but they knew, and Pius, Pius XII must have known, you cannot move this many people mm. with it being a secret. And there are extensive CIA and American intelligence reports from um, Rome, quoted in Steinacher's book and in other places now, which show that the CIA knew it was happening as well. But they were turning a lot of these guys, these Nazis, to work with them against what they saw as the red threat, and that was what the Vatican was scared uh, about, is, you know, godless communism. Yeah. And it's that classic old thing that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Was that Operation it's Paperclip, sadly, or was it before were, then? No, Paperclip was before that. I think Paperclip was part of the deal that was done between Alan Dulles of the um, OSS at that stage, later CIA mm. Director General, and Martin Bormann to enable um, Hitler and Bormann and much of their material to get out of the country at the end of the war. There's distinctly a deal done between the hierarchy of the Nazis and senior members of the American intelligence and banking and industrial community to mm. let this happen and make it work. And as part of that deal, I think Borman gave them paperclip. He gave them Zena von Braun, who eventually put them on the moon. Yeah. Um, yes. Again, something I find, find sickening. Von Braun, you know, colonel in the SS, his factories where they created the B-1 and B-2 rockets murdered tens of thousands of slave laborers yeah. um, and responsible for the death of 8,000 Brits. Yeah, from from B1 and B2s exploding over here. Yeah, and yet he went on to become a major American establishment figure, um, a great American. Well, to me, I mean, it's a bit like putting the guy who planned the 9/11 attacks in charge of air safety in America. It is crazy, isn't him it? The medal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, this man was a murdering. A murderer. But they, 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 I don't they, care how good a scientist he was. They, they, they weren't going to let that knowledge um, escape them, though, were they? Among 120 of his, um, of his colleagues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hence the race for to get them. I mean, they, they, there was a hell of a battle at the end of. They, they, there was a hell of a, a race, wasn't there, at the end of World War II to get to these people? The Russians mm -hmm. and the Americans were, and the Brits, I imagine, were slogging out to try and find these people the first. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, I mean. It, it, for the first time in any war, they had the monuments men from America, you know, who were looking for the stolen art treasures. We had Ian Fleming's um, Red Indians. Um, Ian Fleming was the guy who wrote James Bond. Who was yes, actually, yeah, that's know, right. Incredibly involved in intelligence during World War II. Was he? I didn't and know that. We had groups of people going into areas of, of Soviet interest and everything else. 
bringing back scientists. But mm. um, they must have known where they were. It's not enough to say, well, we cracked Enigma, because at the end of the war, we simply hadn't cracked German um, codes that they were still using. Yeah. Um, so how did we know where all these people were? Yeah, Germany's a big country. How do we know where they'd hidden the material? We have to be told by somebody on the inside. I'm looking at the uh, picture uh, which I, I, I found of the house uh, in uh, Patagonia, I think it is, or somewhere in Argentina, where Hitler is uh, alleged to have lived. It's a big sort of dormer bungalow, a big long-looking house set in some trees. I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with the picture, but it certainly looks very very alpine in nature. The house of Tinalco was built in the um, mid-1940s as a refugee or a refuge for Adolf Hitler. And we believe it formed part of the complex, which um, was known as Adolf Hitler's Valley, to the people who lived there. Um, one of the things I've always liked to do as a journalist, is I'm not a journalist who sits behind a desk, I've been to this place on two separate occasions. I think I said I've been to Argentina on 13 separate occasions, with Simon 17 times. Um, what's important is that people, I think, read the book. This is a story that needs to be told and then they can make up their own mind about what we've discovered. Yes. We don't make things up in Grey Wolf. Um, Grey Wolf reports what we have found out, um, and I think people can really make their own mind up about it. Um, it's a plug. It's available on Amazon, um, at Waterstones, at good bookshops online, pretty much everywhere. Um, the hardback is out in English at the moment all over the world, and the paperback comes out in English in the UK in July. Um, I think it's important that people realize exactly what happened at the end of World War II. It was not the world that we, it, it wasn't the end of a world war that we've always been sold. There was nothing clean about this. It was, in fact, probably one of the dirtiest periods in, um, in history, both for the amount of murder that was carried out and the deeds that were done at the end of it. I've got one question which I, I must ask before, uh, before we lose you, uh, so I'll, I'll ask it first. I watched your interview on, mm. on Sky. Same here, um, yeah. And I must say, it yeah. was quite short. And, and David Frost. Yeah. Yes. It, it, well, I watched them on Sky. It was quite short. And I noticed how almost instantly they seemed to start mentioning Holocaust denial, even even though the subject never even was, was raised by anybody, I don't think. Um, what's going on there? That does seem to be a very strange phenomenon where anybody who talks about anything to do with uh, Germany and deviates from the official story, the Holocaust denial seems to be brought up from nowhere and the interview murdered. Well, you got, I mean, I've, I've been accused of being a neo Nazi, um, accused of being a Holocaust denier and everything else, not just by um, the interview on Sky, which I actually thought was very fair. I know Mark, I've known Mark for a very long time, um, and I'm ex foreign news desk at Sky anyway, so mm -hmm. I have a lot of time for Sky News is reporting and their approach. I think the problem is, is that this is such a controversial story, such a controversial truth, that people are embarrassed about discussing it. And the one thing they don't want to do is to have any revision of the nastiness, of the foulness of that Nazi regime. And mm. that's not something that Grey Wolf does at all. We don't try and revise how bad these people were. Um, we don't try and revise how cruel that whole thing was. What we do want to try and revise is the approach to telling the truth about World War II and the end of it. And the fact that the Nazis, there was no denazification. They didn't go away. They just took off the uniforms and went home. And, um, and became, and I think that's an important lesson for us and, to learn today. And perhaps, be um, that perhaps became there bankers. There are still people out there who want to control the world, and <laughs> um, other people are out there helping them. Uh, yeah, and um, so they took off the uniforms and they put on the suits. I think that's probably exactly what they did. Yes. The suits were probably made by Hugo Boss. <laughs> they made their uniforms in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there, there, is, uh, there is a lot of uh, evidence, I say a lot, there is some evidence to suggest that the Nazis did carry on after World mm. War II in the, in the commerce and, and, and banking world, in some capacity at least. Oh, very definitely. I mean, mm. you also should realise that Something like 25 senior ministers in the West German government post-World War II had all been members of the Nazi party. Now, you don't simply change your views overnight yeah. because you lose. And the reason why so much of this has been hidden, Germany has become an important economic um, and, and partner of America and everybody else in, in the middle of Europe. Um, 
And so maybe we should just be, you know, realistic about this and accept real politics for what it is. Is that you know you have to do dirty deals to let the world carry on. Absolutely. I find that mentally difficult to accept, and um, I'm not mad about it in one way or another. It just is wrong, and mm. I feel that you know once. You look at the evidence that's presented in Grey Wolf, I hope that a lot of other people will start to feel that it's Simon and I are working on our follow-up at the moment, which is called Spider's Web. Okay. Which goes into much more detail about the industrial and banking involvement. That's right. Uh, which yes. has already been published out there. Mm. Um, but I think we wrap it all together and give it a heart, give it a, a, mm -hmm. a core at the Spider's Web, which is in Argentina. It is in an organization run by Martin Borman and his lieutenants. Um, and it's an organization that I'm pretty sure it builds power economically out Oh, we seem to have lost okay. him again there. I don't know if you can still hear us there, Gerard, but um, it was brilliant uh, talking to you. I'm not sure if you're still out there, but uh, that was uh, Gerard. We, uh, we only had the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, uh, we, we, we must get him on again. That was Gerard Williams, uh, who is the uh, co-author of Grey Wolf, Wolf. Uh, An Escape of Adolf Hitler. Uh, sounds very fascinating. It's available on Amazon.co.uk. Uh, yeah, I think it's also on Waterstones, I think he said. And we've got a link to it on our website a Any as well. good bookshop. And bookshops as well. Yeah, so that's great. So that's great. Thanks Fantastic. very much, Gerard. Yeah. Thank you very we'll much, just, Gerard. Uh, send him a message. Shame we had such a terrible line there today. Okay, so I think uh, we'll probably play another little bit of music now. Uh, let's see, what will we go for? Um, let's go for um, Dano, our old favourite. Why not? And uh, the time isn't right. The officers escaped yeah. to Argentina. Are you telling me that the... That's true. Yeah, they, they couldn't get the, uh, the head honcho out. The uh, story of his escape... It'd be unusual, is, uh, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. The story of his, his escape is, is quite interesting. It would certainly make a nice uh, film. Yeah. I'm not sure if there is a film being made of it. I think I read somewhere that there may be a film. There might be. Yeah, we shall have to ask the uh, man himself when the, he comes on. The author we're speaking to today, uh, Gerard Williams, he's a filmmaker as well. He's worked on the uh, yeah. Discovery Channel. I think so, yeah. I think I read that in his uh, in his bio as well. Um, we should probably also credit Simon Dunstan, who is not with us today, but he's the, he's the co-author. He's a military historian. Yeah, well, well, Gerard has been a journalist now for 30 years, is it? I think it was something like that. He's, he's very yeah. well established and uh, I, I believe well respected. I think he's worked for Sky and he's, uh, he's a BBC as well. He's responsible for thousands and thousands of hours of broadcast material. Yeah, yeah. He, what was he, a foreign correspondent, I think yeah, he was, he, if I remember he's correctly. He's worked for uh, Reuters, was it? I think there was BBC, I think, and Sky. We yeah. should have to ask him. He's worked for a lot of big names, anyway. Oh, wow. He certainly seems to know his beans. He's a proper journalist. He seems to know what he's talking about. Well, they've been researching this for five years. That's a long time, isn't it? That's a long time. Mm. The, the book, we should probably give it a pre-plug before he comes on, uh, is called Grey Wolf, uh, The Escape of Adolf Hitler. And, um, yeah, it, it looks like a very interesting book. We've read the synopsis of it and some of the background information, and uh, certainly seems very interesting. Yeah, it's published in October 2011, so it's available on Amazon. Yes, we've got a link to it on our website, actually, as well, as on, we on, on the shop, and, button, um, which actually takes you to Amazon. I've seen Gerard on the uh, Frost Report, David Frost. Did you? And I've, I've not I, seen that. I, uh, yes, I, I watched him on, the, on Sky News. Yeah, I saw the Sky News interview he did, yeah. so we got a few questions uh, for him about that. Rather too short, I thought, for such, yeah. a, for such a great subject. A little bit awkward as well. Yeah, something odd. Yeah, it was very awkward. Mm. He, they didn't seem overly comfortable about uh, having him on at all, did Most they? Most unusual. We shall have to question him about this. We should. Um, any, well, do we want to do any news, or do we want to get the, the guest on? I'm really keen to talk to Gerard, because it's such an interesting subject. He's an interesting chap, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, Grey Wolf, the escape of Adolf Hitler. Let's shall we call him, and then if we if we have time at the end, we'll do some news at the end. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's, let's, let's call him now. Let's then, get shall on we? with it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Calling Gerard live. Hopefully, he should be coming through. We're uh, dialing him in uh, London, I believe. Uh, he's based in London at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, I believe so. He's still working in the media. <laughs> Hello, is that Gerard? Yeah. Hang on. Oh, thanks ever so much. <laughs> We Hello. We, Hello, Gerard. We rang too early. Hi, Gerard. <laughs> Sorry, we, we rang too early. Well, we, we were so excited. Yeah, why, not? why don't we do that? We're so excited to speak to you. We, we, we uh, got ahead of ourselves. We got a bit giddy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, guys. Don't worry. 
Um, so we were just saying that you um, wrote the uh, book and uh, it's taken you quite a while to, to write it. Uh, we only gave a very, very brief overview about what it's about. So I thought we thought we'd leave it to you because you're... Uh, and uh, various other people in Germany now show that over 30,000 of these people escaped from Germany at the end of the war, never mind the amount of Croats and other European fascists that made it uh, to Argentina. And as we started to look at the whole story and started to look at the, um, the, the deaths in the bunker and everything else, it became pretty obvious that what we'd been told for 65 years was simply not true. There was no forensic evidence to the death of Adolf Hitler in the bunker in Berlin. Um, the skull that the Russians have always said was Adolf Hitler's turned out when it was forensically examined by a DNA expert to be that of a young woman. Um, so not even the Russian skull was Hitler's. And as we started to investigate and started to look further and further into the story, it just became, well, compellingly clear that we had been told, um, for whatever reason, the heat of life. It, it seems highly unlikely that he didn't survive. It, it was of his character. It, it was unlike him to uh, commit suicide. He wasn't that type of person, was he? I mean, one of the problems with doing something like this, writing a book like this and being a journalist, is I can't really put myself inside the head of Adolf Hitler. I know historians yeah. put themselves inside the head of people all the time. All that we can do, and what we've done in Grey Wolf, the escape of Adolf Hitler, is present the facts that we have found. Um, Martin Berman, definitely, he wrote that he fully intended to survive. and. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. I'm Mark. Hello. How are you doing? The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! <laughs> Good morning, Mark. Morning, Basil. Morning. And what a show we have. Well, we've got a top guest today. Wow. I'm quite uh, quite keen to get this chap uh, on the air. He's uh, he's an interesting chap, certainly. Well, how and his subject matter. How exciting. What if Hitler had lived? What if he didn't die in the bunker in 1945 and lived and died of old age? In Argentina. In Argentina, of all places. And there seems to be a lot of evidence to support this. There does seem to be a fair bit, certainly. It's... Uh, not quite as uh, as closed as people might think. It seems there's an awful lot of contradictory, or well, contradictory to the mainstream story, at least. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, so many of the uh, minor... That's the, you're the expert. Do you want to just give a rough overview of what it's about? Well, uh, surprisingly, and then something that shocked both Simon Dunstan, my co-writer, and myself, is that we think that, um, well, we're sure, that Adolf Hitler escaped from Germany at the end of World War II, and lived in Argentina for 17 years until his death in 1962. Um, not only Adolf Hitler escaped, but Martin Bormann and Gustavo Müller, the head of the SD, um, mm -hmm. all from the bunker and all from Berlin. And who, who was the other chap there, Martin Bormann? I've, I've heard his name before. I'm not sure who, who he is. Who is he? What Martin did he Bormann do? was the party secretary. He was uh, effectively Hitler's number two, um, the Reichleiter, he was known as. Um, he was the man who organized... Well, the economics of the Nazi party, um, and was probably the most powerful man in the Nazi hierarchy. Right. Um, and the man who controlled access to Hitler in the final days of the war. Well, I mean, we, we never thought that um, we were going to do anything but a rather silly conspiracy theory documentary. I mean, that's how it all started. Um, after I'd been doing a series of documentaries in Argentina on other subjects, quite serious subjects. Um, and we came across this one, and after 30 odd years as a journalist, I thought, you know, I've never, really, I've never done a conspiracy theory film, <laughs> and um, this sounded like a, a great idea, you know, the idea that Adolf Hitler had escaped by submarine, of all things, to Argentina at the end of the war. We came across many, many people in Argentina who said this was true, and our research and the research by other people like Gerald Steinacher... 